the reason that the Bitcoin maximalists, the cyber hornets, if you will, the reason they're passionate and religious about this is because for the first time in human history, you can take all of your wealth and your life force, you can put it into an asset, you can keep the keys, you can take custody of your million dollars, your hundred thousand dollars. No government, no bank can take it away from you. There's nobody to tell you you can't own your life force. And if you have hopes and aspirations for your family, for your religion, for your, for, for your life, then you have the power to achieve those hopes and aspirations without asking the permission of a bank or a government or a politician. If money is uh, energy, right, and, and this energy is going to last a long, long time, energy is essential to life, Bitcoin is about immortal life. It's about achieving your hopes and aspirations for as long as you can conceive of them. Now tell me, you think you're going to love Apple stock or gold or silver bars or bonds or municipals the same way as that? Bitcoin marks a watershed moment in human history, affording individuals complete autonomy and authority over their wealth, a paradigm shift often overlooked by many. Over time, Bitcoin has garnered substantial traction owing to its distinctive features, including its capacity to potentially overhaul the conventional financial system by empowering individuals with unparalleled control over their assets. In a notable interview, Michael Saylor expounded on why Bitcoin eclipses traditional assets such as stocks, gold, and major tech stocks. He underscored Bitcoin's role as a secure store of value and its potential for long-term wealth preservation. Stay engaged until the conclusion of the discussion where Saylor explores why Bitcoin presents superior investment prospects for the future in comparison to traditional avenues. Bitcoin is, is the first software network in the history of the world that can, that, that can uh, pull monetary energy. So the, these Bitcoiners have figured out something that is really a thing of beauty and extraordinary, extraordinary value. They're pooling pure monetary energy on a network. And, and once you, if I take a hundred million dollars and I put it into Bitcoin, it could sit there for a decade, like in a battery, it won't bleed out. You're not losing two to 4% a year. And, uh, and I can put it in the palm of my hand and I can move it around the planet for a few dollars in a few minutes. And we've never in the history of the world figured that out. And, uh, and so it's very early on. It's, my, I, I like monetary, I, I like software networks that are worth more than $100 billion that are, are 50x bigger than their competitor that are going to eat the world that 99% of the world doesn't agree with me on. So in fact, I like the fact that people don't understand it, don't agree with it, are afraid of it because I couldn't afford to buy it if they all agreed with me. Yeah. And we're... I believe we're at that inflection point for Bitcoin where it's like it's big enough to be unstoppable, but it's still new enough that there are 10,000 billionaires or billion dollar entities and maybe five of them get it. Maybe 10 of them out of 10,000 get it. And so the catalysts are all to the upside. And most of these risks, they've been worked out over the last decade. One, you know, I, you could make, make a list of 100 things that might go wrong. We've watched them all happen. They haven't killed it. And we're just sitting right at the cusp of something really fabulous here. First of all, I think that the historic knock on Bitcoin is it's highly volatile. And for the first 10 years, uh, exactly. there are lots of volatilities uh, that took place. Every single day, I look at the 30 years, uh, the 30 treasuries and swaps. I look at 10-year treasuries. I look at the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000. I look at gold. I look at silver. I look at Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Mm -hmm. And then I compare them all to Bitcoin. And I got to tell you, Keith, like my unscientific view is on every single day, at least half of those assets are more volatile than Bitcoin. And on a lot of volatile days, I've seen I've seen 80 to 90 percent of them be more volatile than Bitcoin. So I think there's a historic narrative slash belief. People think they know this is volatile. But in fact, it's not looking that volatile to me over the past three months. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think, I don't think over the next decade it's going to have the same characteristics of volatility 
that it had over the last decade. Let me tell you why big tech is not a good store of value over the long term and why gold is not a good store of value over the long term. Let's start with big tech. It, Apple's fine, but when Apple's PDE goes to 100 and then 500 and then 1,000, at some point, the CEO of Apple is going to print more stock or he's going to buy something with it. And the way that you destroy companies is you do dilutive acquisitions. Right. So the truth is Apple stock is not scarce. The, the, the executive team can and will eventually print more. And if that doesn't dilute you, then they've got regulatory risk, competitive risk, execution risk, a lot of moving parts, right? And maybe the Chinese government takes a different view toward Apple, just like the American government takes a certain view toward Huawei, right? So that's why they're not good over the long term. Are they good stores of value over one, two, three, five years? Yeah. Over a decade? Not so sure. Over 100 years? Absolutely not. Now, why isn't gold a good store of value? If you put $100 million into gold and the gold miners print 2 to 3% more a year, let's say 2% more, mm -hmm. well, over 100 years, you lose 88% of your purchasing power. Now, why did that work in the past few hundred years? Because gold dilutes 2% a year and the economy grows by 2% a year. So roughly the power of what you can buy with gold as you mine 2% more a year in a 2% expanding economy is the same. That's one reason it worked. The other reason it worked is we had no other option. There's no choice. So bottom line is you want to store $100 million for 100 years, you put it in gold. Under the best case, you'll lose 85% of it. Under the likely case, you'll lose it all because the bank will fail, the country will fail, somebody will seize it or someone will join it. All the guys that have more money than God in this world, right? they have it because they bought or owned or created uh, a technology that changed the life of a billion people. If you show me a sugar cube that you could produce a billion of and give it to people and for the rest of their life, they would be perennially happy with no health issues. I would say you should invest in that wine network. But what we're talking about here is a monetary network never before in the history of the world created at the beginning of the S curve. If you buy at the beginning of the S curve and you're right, then you're going to have an extraordinary return as an investor. If you buy at the end of the S-curve, maybe you'll hold some value. Look, look, let me ask you one more question. Say you actually wanted to take a million dollars and you wanted to put it in an investment and give it to your daughter or your granddaughter in 30 years. How would you do that? Like, how do you pass down a material amount of money to your granddaughter or your daughter in 30 years because I, I can't do it with real estate in Florida. They tax it away from you in 30 years. I can't do it with any stock because I don't know the stock won't get destroyed in 30 years. I can't do it with gold because it's going to be cut in half and maybe seized by someone in 30 years. I can't do it with a bond because, and I can't do it with currency. With Bitcoin, because you can't make any more of it, it's, you've got this pure piece of financial energy you could buy it, you could hold it for no carry cost, and you would be able to hand it to someone in 30 years. So the magic of this is for the first time in human history, we figured out how to send money forward in time 10,000 days without losing it. It's a, it's a magical thing. By the way, if I give you a battery, if you put all your, if you put a million dollars of electricity in a battery, it bleeds 2% a month. You lose 24% of your energy in a year. You can't do it with a battery. The gold battery bleeds 2 to 3% a year. We've got a battery that doesn't bleed energy. <clears throat> it's a magical achievement. Nobody in the history of economics ever created a closed, a closed monetary system that respects the laws of thermodynamics, and it doesn't bleed off monetary energy into the atmosphere. I mean, how is that not something that you would want to put some amount of monetary energy into to protect for the future? Because what really matters is with Facebook, does it work? Do a billion people use it? With Apple, do they buy it? With Google, do they use it? With Bitcoin, will they use it? All the, all the near-term trading models, they'll work for 90 days, 30 days, whatever. As long as everybody else in your trading universe sees the world, you see it. But over a decade, over 20 years, over 30 years, 
the laws of thermodynamics are going to kick into place. And it's pretty obvious Bitcoin is a better long-term asset than gold or corn futures or soybeans or any company run by a CEO, no matter how august and intelligent they are, they're all just merely mortal. And Bitcoin is something better than that.